Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, we've begun this series, this week two of this series, Community Matters. Um, and as Danielle already said, we had a packed house here on Sunday or on Wednesday night. Uh, most of you, probably 90% of you, were actually here. So I don't need to talk about it much. But the, other, the rest of you, if you weren't here, number one, you're in the vast minority as far as the people in this room. And number two, hope you come. Hope you'll join us. Um, last week, we, uh, we visited a verse that is, if, if, if our series had a theme verse, it would be uh, the theme verse. And so I just want to briefly take a look at it. I don't have time to cover what I preached last week. But I really encourage, if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to, to go ahead and to, to go to our website now. It's easier than it has ever been to watch our, our, this, the sermons. You can go to the website and, and there's a, a button you can click right there on, the, uh, on, the, on our website. Uh, but I encourage you to watch the sermon because it is foundational, lays a foundation for what I'm going to be saying over the next eight weeks. So go watch that this week if you haven't. But the verse that we... Um, really spent some time on was this. Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. And we reviewed, or we, we talked much last week about the, the, the uniqueness of this statement. Number one, Jesus, because he wrote the 10, he gets to add one. He gets to add number 11. And we don't get to do that. He does. The other unique aspect of this verse is that he does not say to his disciples, a new commandment I give you that you love the world. He said that in other places and other ways. He didn't say a new commandment I, I give you that you love the outcast or that you love the unlovely or that you love the, the, uh, the, the widow and the orphan and the immigrant uh, uh, or your neighbor. He, he, doesn't, he says that other places, but the uniqueness of this verse is that he looks at 12 ragtag uh, men who have been, uh, who've sacrificed much to follow him for the last three years. And he says, gentlemen, you love one another. That's the new commandment. So today we're going to stay in John chapter 13 and we're going to look at a passage that is very familiar to some of you. And I'm going to take my time in plodding things through this story, though it is familiar to many of you. I'm going to take my time and, and I'm going to describe each step in today's story, uh, not just for those of, th those of you who are, are new to the Bible. There are, there are some of us who are new to the Bible. Glad you're here. But I'm not going to take my time in this story today uh, just for you all. I'm going to take my time and and slowly move through the story. For those of us who, who find the story so familiar that sometimes we, we miss out. We think there's nothing left to glean or to gather from this story because it is so familiar. Um, let's breathe it in. And, and let's see if there is maybe more for us to deal with. I, I assure you there is. The context is this. The context is it is uh, almost uh, Passover in Jerusalem. That's the backstory, And so Jesus knows what, what's about to happen. He's about to go to this execution um, tool known as a cross. He knows he's headed there. Uh, it is about to be Passover. What I believe is going on in this story, in, in, in the story of Passover, is God the Father in heaven is now drawing a crowd. He's about to lift his son up on the cross that all men and women might be drawn to him. And I believe in the theater and the pageantry of Passover there in Jerusalem, Jerusalem where, <clears throat> where over a million people would come to the city on that on that, on that, we'll call it a weekend, on, for, for that event. Over a million people from other countries, from other cities, would come to Jerusalem for the Passover weekend. And what I believe is happening, again, is that God the Father in heaven is drawing for himself a crowd. 
that he might put on display his love, his compassion for the lost and dying world. So that's what's happening. That's the backdrop. That's the context. And now let's read from John chapter 13. I'll read out loud. You follow along silently. Now before the feast of Passover, it's imminent, it's upon them. And before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own, that's these 12 men around him, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I love that phrase. I love that sentence. Having loved them, he now loved them to the end. Jesus knew that his hour had come. That's what this says. He knew that his hour had come. What does that mean? It, 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 yes, it means that he, he, he knows that, that, that he's about to go to the cross, but it means so much more than that. He knows that, that what, what the Father had, had always intended to do, it's, it's now going to happen. It's now, it's now going to come to fruition. Though he has, he, has, he has had this attitude of God, the Father, if there's I any other way of doing this, if there's any other way of, 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 of saving the world, then let's go that route. But if not, if this is it, if this is what, what your will is, Father, then not my will, but your will. That has been Jesus' attitude during, during all his years of ministry, I believe. He will soon speak those words. And so, so, so the, he knows, as it says, his hour had come. And Jesus knew that he was about to suffer a most horrendous sort of torture, followed uh, by a brutal execution. Now, a normal person and I'm going to call us normal, uh, you, me, normal people, when we receive uh, even a hint of, of bad news, not, not to make light of this, some of us have experienced this lately, but if we receive, uh, for instance, an abnormal doctor's report, e even the hint that something might be wrong, then we tend to turn inward. We tend to kind of fall apart. We tend to be th thinking mostly about self at that point. And I understand that. And that's it's, it's rightfully so. But think on the fact that when Jesus knows that his crucifixion is now imminent, he turns outward. He doesn't turn inward. He begins focusing, not in a myo myopic fashion, but focusing on an external fashion, focusing on his, those around him. Jesus, on this occasion, he knows for sure, it says. His hour has come. The gig is up. The moment he was dreading is here. In a few hours, it's inevitable, he will die. And in this moment, the writer, John, says, having loved his dear twelve friends, he loved them to the end. Now let's take our time uh, and, 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 and let's focus on that phrase. He loved them to the end. This does not just mean that he loved them till the day he died. It doesn't just mean, although this is a valiant statement, it doesn't just mean like when a husband would say to his wife, Honey, I will, I will love you to the end. That's a beautiful statement, but it means so much more than that. This statement that John makes about Jesus loving the disciples to the end. It means this. It means that he loved them fully. Back in the day we would have said he loved, he loved them to the max. To the nth degree, the whole nine yards, he loved them to the utmost. With his, with his entire capacity to love, Jesus loved these twelve men. The whole ball of wax, the, the whole enchilada, however you want to say it, he loved them 
with all the capacity that he had to love them. He loved, he loved Thomas, who would famously doubt Jesus, doubt that he had actually defeated death. Doubting Thomas, the one who would say, unless I see physical proof, I won't believe it. Jesus loved Thomas to the end, to the nth degree. Jesus loved Peter. Peter, the, 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 the prideful, arrogant, always running ahead. Peter, who, who when the chips were down, he would deny Jesus. Jesus knew that ahead of time. You will deny me three times before the rooster crows. Before the sun even comes up. In just a few verses, he's going to tell him that. You will deny me three times. And yet, Jesus loved Peter to the end. <clears throat> and he loved the disciple who in just a few moments later, a few minutes after this story, would betray him with a Judas kiss for a fistful of gold. He loved him. He loved him to the end. He loved them to the end. Why did he love them to the end? I believe it's because God had given him to them or given them to him. They were under his care. Jesus knew these 12 men God has given me. Watch care over them. I will, I will not just love them. I will love them to the max. I will love them to the end. And how does he on this evening before his death express his love for them? Because love, <clears throat> love consummated is love that is expressed. Love that's hidden never talked about, never on display, is, is not full love. It's, it's, not, it's not a love that is, that, is, that, is, that is expressed in its fullest capacity. But, but Jesus, how does he this evening, before his death, express his love in its fullest extent? He shares a meal with them. Like we did on Wednesday night. Like we will this coming Wednesday night. There's just something beautiful about sharing a meal. When we do that on a seasonal basis as a church, and, and when we do that for the next eight weeks, I just go home every Wednesday night, or if it's, if it's a, a Christmas Eve meal, or if it's a Thanksgiving meal that we share together, I always go home just with a glow. There's just something about sharing a meal together. But Jesus, on this, on this occasion, on this evening, he doesn't actually finish his supper. It says, Jesus, skipping to verse 4, Jesus rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them uh, with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus didn't finish his supper. At this point, I can imagine he probably wasn't very hungry. I, I, I can imagine that his, his stomach was probably in, in knots because he's God and he's man and he knows this is going to hurt in every way what I'm experience is going to hurt so, so he rose from the table they would have been reclining almost lying on a table a really low slung table that was the culture of the day that's how they would have been eating he would have he, would have, he, he rose up and he took care of a very menial, very real need. The task of washing feet was surely above his status. He's a rabbi. He is a teacher. 
he has these 12 students that, that are in, in, a, in a formal fashion following him around for years as he, the rabbi, pours into their lives, the disciples, the students. In the culture of the day, that was a very formal relationship that he had with them. He rises up to, to, to wash their feet. Now, I was going to bring my fishing my, my chanclas that I, fish, that I fish with and I was going to show them to you and I didn't bring them for one reason and that is because, because they stink and I'm all cleaned up I'm all cleaned up for church today and I really don't want to carry them in here and I'm kind of embarrassed by them. Those shoes, maybe you've got some chanclas maybe you have some sandals that you garden in. These, these shoes that I, that I fish in, I also cut trees in. And they just, they're, they're a little crooked and worn out and they stink. And, and the stink, like if you wear them, it stays with you for a few days. Like, like it's, <laughs> that's too much information, I'm sorry. Um, so in the culture of the day, in the hygiene, uh, the, the, the hygienic scene of the day, like, that's, that's why these, these 12 disciples needed their feet washed. And that's Jesus. And this task of washing their feet was surely above his status. Teachers and rabbis of the day would never be seen washing their students' feet. Quite the opposite. In reality, in that culture... Here's who would wash feet. Because washing, the washing of feet was, was a very standard practice in that day. It wasn't odd. Like it would be odd today if I washed your feet. It wasn't odd at all that day. What was odd was that the, the rabbi was doing the, foot, the, the, the washing of the feet. In, in reality, in that culture, uh, Gentile slaves would have washed feet. In, in, in that day, uh, women would have been the foot, the foot washers of choice. In that, in that day, those who had been, uh, uh, the, the, the had been trafficked, humans who had been trafficked in that day, they would have done the foot washing. But a Jewish rabbi had no business washing feet. Verse 3, which we didn't read, says that, that the Jesus, he knew who he was. He knew that he'd come from the Father. He, he knew that he was going back to the Father. Any, any movie or, or musical that gives you the impression that Jesus was struggling with his divinity, am I or am I not God? Any, any movie or musical that, that, that gives you that impression doesn't square with Scripture. The Bible makes it very clear. Jesus knew who he was, who he is. He was, he was confident and comfortable with his divinity. With the fact that he was part of the Godhead. That, that, was, not, that, that, was, that was not to be questioned. He, he had confidence in that. Verse 3 says that. He knew where he'd come from. He knew where he was going back to. And yet, and yet, verse 4 says that he stripped down to his undergarments. That means exactly what you think it means. He stripped down to his undergarments and he, he, he wrapped a towel, tied a towel around his waist and he looked the part of a slave. Remember earlier on in Jesus' ministry when John the Baptist said, uh, he said to his, his people, John the Baptist, he said, someone's coming, meaning Jesus, someone's coming, uh, he, he will soon be in our presence, and, and that person, his sandals, I am not even uh, worthy to untie. Jo John is saying, John is saying the Messiah is coming, and even the lowliest task of, of touching Jesus' feet, I wouldn't even be worthy to do that. That's how esteemed Jesus is. He's Messiah. He's the Son of God. He is God himself. To touch another person's feet in those days of substandard hygiene 
was a sure sign of lowliness. It was, it was, it was to embrace personal humility. That's what Jesus did. It was, it was rather gross. But Jesus didn't mind. In, the, in fact, Jesus, he chose this act. He chose this moment, in, of, uh, this moment in time. Of all the places, think on this, of all the places Jesus could have been in his final hours. Look, you and me, like Sunday's 11. Like even Sunday's 11, like man, I got like a million places I ought to be right now. Think on this. Jesus, the final hours of his life. All the places that he could have been. And this is where he wanted to be. And this is what he wanted to be doing. You know this story. Let, let's, let's move on to verse 12. And, 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 and what's, what's going to happen here now is Jesus is about to take what we expect him to say and turn it on its head. Verse 12. <clears throat> when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments, he got dressed again. And resumed his place, would have been, which would have been again reclining at the table and leaning back on a pillow. He said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? Verse 13, you call me teacher, and you are right, for so I am. If then you, if then, uh, or I'm sorry, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you example, an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I give thanks for the word of the Lord. So Jesus finishes, he redresses, he sits down or, or reclines, and he asks them, do you understand what just happened here? And, and of course, uh, as usual, they don't. Uh, very, Twelve very ordinary man, men. And they, they don't fully grasp it, and I don't judge them. I would have been just as confused. I'm no brighter than them. Their rabbi had just put himself in an embarrassing situation. And perhaps they were a bit embarrassed for him, like, oh, this is, this is, this is coming unraveled. This is spiraling downward. And, and, and then Jesus says to them, If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to. And what do we expect? I mean, you've read it now, but, but I, I, would, I would suggest that, that what we want to hear, what we expect to hear, is Jesus saying, If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also what to wash my feet. I suppose we would all, every one of us in this room, uh, at least most of us, we would get in line to wash Jesus' feet. I mean, if, if he were here today, I would have this debtor's eth ethic sort of attitude. I'd be like, you've done so much for me. I, I, would, I would gladly wash the feet of Jesus I would gladly serve Jesus in any way. And, and we, we make those statements. We, we say those kind of things. I just want to serve Jesus. 
You not so much, but I want to serve Jesus. But that is not what Jesus says on that evening. He does not say, your teacher has washed your feet, now you ought also to wash your, wash your teacher's feet. Rather, he says, if I am willing to wash your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. Here's what he's saying. The way I love you, you ought also to love one another like that. Jesus doesn't have time to mince words. You know that feeling. Like when, when something is, 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 is about, it's imminent, it's about to happen, it's tragic. You're like, I don't have time to waste here. He only has a few more hours. He will soon be hanging on the cross. And therefore, verse 17 is so engaging. It's so convicting. And it's so poignant. Verse 17, he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We, we as a people, we as a church, we as individuals, we are so often, we're just, we're just not in the mood for the doing of the things. So we settle for the knowing of the things. You know what I mean? We're just not in the mood for the doing of the things, so we'll just be okay with the knowing of the things. And the thing here, of all the things that Jesus could have highlighted, because your last words, when you're about to die, your last words, they're important, your last words are lasting words words of all the things Jesus could have highlighted. There's one thing he highlights. Love one another. We're so often just not in the mood to love one another. So devoid of love, we settle for the next best thing, I suppose, and that is knowing lots of stuff. And Jesus says, look, if you know what I'm talking about, you will be blessed to do them. As a pastor, as a pastor, I can grow weary, grow tired of other people letting me down or tired of being, being hurt so I can settle for the knowing. And that often tops, uh, stop short of the doing. Stop short of the loving. It's safer just to know. It's risky to actually do. How about you? Do you find it safer as a Christian to live in the realm of the knowing rather than the doing? As I said, Jesus doesn't have time here. He doesn't have time to waste. It's his final, it's his, these are his final hours. And what does he camp out on? What does he emphasize? Um, what does he major on? And I, I point that out because there are so many things that we as Christians in the name of Jesus camp out on. And, 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 and major on and spend our, 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 all of our, our energy and resources on in the name of Jesus for the sake of Jesus. And they're things that Jesus never highlighted himself. In his final hour, what does he highlight? That is loving one another. In this same chapter, in fact, John chapter 13 and 14 and I think 15 is just this, this, this picture of all that Jesus said in his final hours to the disciples. You should go home this afternoon. I hope it rains and you can just, you can just read. John chapter 13, 14, and 15. But, but, but let's just look at the, at the end of John 13 here. This, again, this is what we actually camped out on last week. Jesus says to his disciples, his 12, these 12 apostles, little children... And that's not an insult. Uh, it's as though I were to say to you, I love you guys like my kids. I'm going to talk to you today like you're, like, like you're a Caulfield. 
Like you're one of my kids. He says, little children, <clears throat> to these grown bearded men, <clears throat> yet a little while and I'm, I'm with you. Uh, you'll seek me and, and, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And there's verse 34, we read it earlier. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. He just washed their feet. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He's saying, gentlemen, friends, dear brothers, you are all you've got. I mean, you're, gonna, you're going to betray me and take your own life. Um, you're going to deny me. You're going to doubt me. Uh, but, but you are all you've got. And here's what's going to get you through the next few hours. And here's what's going to get you through the next few months. And on this, I will build my church. Your love for one another. I have loved you, dear brothers, so now you love one another. And that will be enough. And then he says what at the end? He says, not only will that be enough, but the whole world will know that you are mine, will know that you belong to me by your love for one another. I have heard some of you in the last week, uh, and, and I, I appreciate this, uh, I've heard you in the last week say, Randy, I have this tension as you've preached on love. I go to work and I just, I want, to, I want people to know me by my love. And I think that's great. And I think that's keeping in, uh, in keeping with Scripture. That's not what Jesus says here. What Jesus says here is, your love, disciples, for one another, is what will be this wonderful tool for evangelism as the world looks in and says, those people love each other. Now when you go and you love your boss who's mean to you and you go and, and you love your neighbor who's rude to you, is that, is that a beautiful picture of Jesus? Yes. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking in here about our love for one another. You've all, you are all you've got. I washed your feet. Wash one another's feet. Serve one another. We're going to talk next week about how this love that we have for one another, this love that, that, that we express to one another on Wednesday night, this love that we express for one another in tangible ways throughout the week, offline, when we're not here together. Next week, next Sunday, I'm going to explain to you, unpack for you, how that is inherently evangelistic. How that leads to other people being saved. How that leads to non-Christians being drawn to Jesus and being drawn to River Church. I'll explain that in a nuts and bolts sort of a way next Sunday. But to end today, briefly, let's talk about this. What it really means for Christians to love one another. What I think Jesus had in mind when he when he instructs us through John 13, you, River Church, love one another. As I have loved you, you love one another. Three simple ideas. To love one another, or to, 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 to love others well, each other well, one another well. There are really three, three big ideas here. The, the first one is this. I must... Humble myself. Have you ever noticed? Everyone wants to be humble, but no one wants to be humbled. If I were to come to you and 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 point out prideful tendencies in your life, you would be deeply offended because everyone wants to be humble but no one wants to be humbled. 
Jesus says this. He says, A student is not greater than his teacher. In so many ways, Christians are often reluctant or unwilling to stoop to the depths that Jesus stooped. What I mean by that is, there, there, there are so many things that Jesus was willing to do that you and I are often unwilling to do. <clears throat> Completely uh, the, menial tasks uh, that Jesus was, was willing to complete, he was willing to accomplish. Um, in other words, we are in many ways just unwilling to serve the way Jesus served. We are unwilling to humble ourselves. So the first big idea is that, that if I'm going to love you well, and you're going to across the, the aisle, across the chairs here, if, if we are in our little church, if we're going to love one another well, then we are going to humble ourselves individually. Prideful tendencies. These may hurt, and I don't have anybody in mind. I have everybody in mind, and I have mostly me in mind. But if we're going to talk about humility, prideful tendencies would be, would be thought, thoughts, <laughs> attitudes that go like this. Well, I'm the busiest person in the room. I can't serve you. Perhaps it's, I'm the exception because my job is important and your job isn't. Prideful tendencies that I've struggled with. Number three would be, all the important tasks at River Church are taken. And, and the menial tasks at River Church would be uh, below me. There's only five, so... Uh, the, the, the fourth prideful tendency would be, um, I, can, I can come and go as I please. Which, of course, in a family setting, we know that does not work. We know that. And, and, and prideful tendency, the fifth one, is I can, I can attend without emotionally investing. Or without investing in any way. I can attend without really investing my time. I can attend without really investing my emotion. I can attend without really investing my money. And, and what I would say is if we are going to uh, be a people who are about the doing, not just the knowing, as Jesus said, if you, if you know what I'm talking about, you will be blessed to do what I'm talking about. If we are actually going to be... Uh, uh, Lovers, rather than just talkers, then, then the first big idea is that I'm going to humble myself. And the second big idea is I'm going to make time. This is maybe the most difficult one for, for many of us. I've said this several times on purpose today. Jesus must have had a thousand other things he could have been doing on that evening. He could have been having dinner with his mom. He could have been making one more pass uh, with his healing hand uh, just, to, just to touch a few hundred more people and see them physically healed. There, there, are, I won't, there, there are many, many things that Jesus could have been doing that night. He was about to go to the cross. He was about to defeat death. He was about to ascend in, uh, to, to his heavenly, uh, ascend to his heavenly Father. But on that evening, when he had many other things on his mind, perhaps. It seems as though he only had one thing on his mind, and that was making time to attend to the hygienic needs of his students. And really, what he's doing is he's, he's making time 
to, to love his friends. I often don't think I have time to serve people. I, I often don't think I have the time that is necessary to, to love you, to love others, to slow down, to make time for those in need. Sometimes because we don't want to make time for people in need, what we do is we, we uh, delegitimize their need in the first place. We'd rather not, we, I'm so prideful, I don't want to give time to that need, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to marginalize that need, uh, figure out ways of explaining that need away in your life, and then I don't have to give you my time because my time is precious to me. And if we are going to be lovers and not just talkers, then we're going to have to make time. As Jesus made time. And the third big idea, the last one is this, and that is very similar to what we've already said. Uh, I'm going to have to inconvenience myself. <clears throat> On that night, Jesus got up from supper. He got up from his meal. The, the, the main reason I might get up from my meal is if I want more iced tea. And Nolan won't get it for me, so I have to get it myself, right? That's about the only reason I'm going to get up for my meal. But on that night, Jesus got up from his meal. They, this, may, this, may, this may have been his last meal before his execution. We don't know that, but it, 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 it's quite possible. And he got up from it. This didn't really surprise his disciples. I'll tell you why I say that. He had always put his disciples' needs first. They worried about him because of it. Do you remember this story early in uh, Jesus' ministry? You can look it up later. It's John chapter 4. His disciples, they urged him. He was, he was, uh, he was attending to, uh, he was witnessing to the, the woman at the well. He was talking to the woman at the well. He, John 4, look it up later. And, and they come, they were, on a, they were away in the city or they were, they were away from the well. They come back to the well and, and his disciples uh, urge Jesus to eat a bite of food. They say, Rabbi, eat. They'd like gone and gotten sandwiches or something and they came, Rabbi, eat. And he says to them, he says, I have food to eat that you do not know about. That's what he said on that day. And, and, and I, I can relate to the disciples. Here's, they thought someone else had brought him some food. Because he's talking about, I have food that you don't even know about. And, and he's like, oh, I guess somebody else had brought him food first. So he has to explain it to them. This is how Jesus ministry had, had, had always been. He, he explained to them on that day, my food is different. My nourishment, my food is to, the, is to do the will of my heavenly Father and to accomplish his work. You see, Jesus had always put his disciples' needs first. They worried about him because of it, because they weren't like that. You see, some of the most, <clears throat> some of the things uh, that are most important are going to create deep inconveniences in your life. Said another way, you see, some things are more important than your convenience. And that's convicting to me because I love convenience. The most weighty and pressing matters are certainly more important than my convenience. It's certainly worth missing a meal or two. If I'm going to love you well, if we are going to love one another well, if we are going to be a people who are doers of the word, not just knowers of the word, then we're going to have to inconvenience ourselves. Don't wait, for, don't wait for your love for the church. And I'm really talking 
tangible ways, and I'm really talking about this local body, River Church itself, not talking hypothetically or theoretically here. Don't wait for your love for the church to be convenient. It never will be. That's, that's not really love. As I've said over the last month or so in leading up to this um, series, I really believe this series is, is to be a culture shifting sort of a season for us as a church. I feel that. I, I believe that's what the Holy Spirit is going to do in our lives. I, I felt that Wednesday night. I feel like we're just shifting. The needle is moving a bit and I pray that it continues to move. Let us be a people who are doers of the word. Join me in prayer if you would.